<laughs> Wouldn't have it any other way. Maybe, maybe we're all waiting. Let's maybe intro each one of you guys. So uh, Jerry, we'll get to you because we're going to kind of talk to you in a second here. But um, Benji, maybe if you want to kind of intro who you are. It's your world. Why are you here? My name is Benji, guys. I uh, work, uh, work directly with Danny with Breakthrough Academy on uh, kind of the marketing and sales side. So I guess my role is like assessment specialist. My job is to um, kind of uh, assess entrepreneurs and their businesses and get to know them super well and make sure that this is uh, a good fit for them and then bring them in and, and onboard them into the program. And today, I think what I'm going to be doing is monitoring the chat box um, and just sort of answering your guys' questions and, and sort of facilitating this while Danny and Barry kind of take the reins on the webinar. Cool, man. And then uh, we've got off to the side here who's uh, probably called all of you once, um, Mr. Brennan, who's, yeah, his hands off to the side. <laughs> can't see him. Uh, Brennan, you want to come on camera for a second? Just tell him who you are and what you're doing here. You probably didn't expect that. <laughs> come say hi. <laughs> this is Brennan. Hey. I uh, work just to support Danny and Benji and make sure that I talk to everybody that's, uh, that's in our system and some people that aren't. And my goal is to, to chat with you guys. Cool, which he's probably gonna do. So he'll probably call some of the guys uh, registered for this webinar right now. But you'll probably hear from him over time if, uh, if you haven't heard from him before. He's a good man as well. Um, sweet, so we're about five two. Let's maybe get rolling. Um, okay, I guess we'll see you in a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's maybe get rolling and uh, dive into can we bring people off uh, off of, uh, can we just have, uh, allow access to the smaller group? Uh, yeah, yeah. So let me move each one of you to panelists. Um, Benji, are you able to promote people to panelists or no? Um, let's see. If we just go into the attendees section, um, you yeah. can click on more and then it should say promote panelists. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Fernando, Gene, Steve, if you guys want to come on to video, you can. Fernando, there you are. And Andrea, Steve, feel free if you'd like to, if you don't, you know, not in the other world. Welcome in. And we'll get rolling here. So, if you yeah, have more people come in, Bench, feel free to just promote them to panelists. Uh, we'll are you going to do that? We'll do, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, let's get rocking. So, uh, pull this up. And large screen this. Can you hear me? All right, everyone. So we've got um, we've got about an hour and a half here, so it's quite a bit of time. So thanks for being with us. I know it is getting to be the busy season for those who are seasonal. Um, May is what we used to call back in the painting days when I used to run a painting company. We used to call it mayhem, which is basically it is the greatest time of year because you're training new people, you're getting a bunch of new jobs up and got it going. The weather's dicey sometimes depending on where you live, but you got like kind of dicey weather if you're working outside and, uh, and life is kind of crazy. So I appreciate it. if you are on the webinar today, thanks for coming and uh, taking your time with us. We'll, uh, we'll strive to give you some good value, some good nuggets and, and tell a pretty incredible story as well. Just about one of our members, um, 505 Junk and, and some of how they've really reached, um, I'd say the next level of, of how to run their trades and home service companies. So there should be lots of nuggets out of today. And uh, yeah, hope is to give you guys some value. So let's do it. So like I said, uh, today we're gonna to talk about 505 Junk and kind of their story and how they've really grown from, I would say kind of like a grassroots level entrepreneur to much more of like an enterprise level entrepreneur. And I'm gonna let them tell their story a little bit, but um, Barry's on the line with us today. He's one of the co-founders, um, absolute stud. Uh, I met him about three years ago when we were kind of getting BTA up and rolling. Um, I think I cold called you Barry, eh? I cold called you on the phone a few times. You didn't, you didn't yeah, yeah, Dan, Danny had cold called me and it was, it was quite funny because, you know, like classic, any business owner, when you get the cold call, it's, you, you know, you kind of shrug it off once, twice, three times. Then finally, he started asking these questions and it was like, okay, this guy, this guy's legitimate. He's not trying to sell me, you know, some search engine optimization or something like that. And yeah, the long story short is we ended up meeting in person and it, we've, we've kind of been connected ever since then. And he turned into a bit of a friend now, man. So it's good. So he, he, it's pretty incredible. He, him and his business partner, Scott, are the two founders of 505 Junk. When I met with them, the two of them, they were kind of doing most everything in the business. You know, everything from junk removal to working in the office. They were the, you know, chief, chief, chief uh, chef and bottle, bottle washer, right? So you were kind of doing everything. Um, their cash flow was relatively tight. I mean, you guys were year to year just putting all your money back into the business and didn't have much left to spend. And it was, I remember you speaking, it was pretty hard just cash flow wise. 
And uh, ultimately their day was filled with a lot of just putting out fires, a lot of reactions to the day to day of, of running their junk mobile business. And over the years we've been working with them, they've kind of taken it to this next level where they've got a fully, uh, you know, fully developed staff, good job descriptions. Everyone's kind of doing their role. Um, they're quite profitable and I'll let them speak to kind of their story a bit, but they've, they've really achieved new heights now when they started actually franchising their business. So um, it's only been about three years, it's been quite the, uh, with the journey for you guys, but I thought maybe just we start out today. Just, I'd love to hear your story. Just maybe speak to a bit of kind of where you come from and, and what's taken you guys to where you're at today. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of had a funny, like even, even dating back before 505 junk, I, I um, moved to Whistler. It's in British Columbia, just a big ski resort, um, similar to a, kind of like Aspen, I guess, in Colorado. And, and I ended up wanting to be a professional snowboarder. So I did that for, um, for a couple of years, we traveled around North America, South America, and just kind of lived like ski bums, really. And I ended up breaking my ankle, um, which which obviously wasn't good if you're a snowboarder trying to, you know, do all the tricks and stunts like you guys saw in the Olympics there. Um, and so my sponsors dropped me. I went back to school um, and realized that that wasn't for me at all. So I dropped out of college and started a junk removal business and the premises of it is really that we pick up people's material that they don't want and we help them regain their space again. So, you know, what started was Scott and I in our, in my parents' basement, just kind of, you know, we bought a used pickup truck and a beat up old trailer and, and was lugging junk around for people. Um, and it's, it really started to take off when we got kind of our vision dialed in that we didn't want to, you know, just be the two guys picking, you know, junk forever. Eventually we'd want to employ good people and build a brand and, and not work, you know, 60 hours a week, you know, for the next 20 years kind of thing. So, um, so we kind of, we grew it just really by doing that. Just, we, we brought in some people to help pick up with the material, but my business partner, Scott and I, to get to that 420,000, you know, we were everything from the janitor to putting out fires to picking up the junk to training people but not really having a good training system um and that's when that phone call from i guess danny came where he, he I, I don't I, I swear you we had met before or something because he came right at the perfect timing and explained this this idea of being able to kind of systematize your business and and put the right people in place so that you don't have to do it every day um and so it's kind of taken off since then. So um, without getting into too many details, we yeah, we're running maybe 15 staff right now. We'll be up to probably just over 20 <laughs> in peak season in the summer. Um, in the last, I guess, year, we've, we've kind of reinvested a lot of our profit to develop a franchise model. Um, so we launched our first two franchise locations this year and they're, they're off to a great start as well. Um, they're actually, they're, they're, they're profitable in the first, um, four or five months in business, which is great. Um, and we've got all, all the people are in place knowing what to do. So it's, it's been a good kind of transition over the last six or seven years. And thanks for being on here, man. Like, you know, one of the things I, I love about what's going on right now is we, we have quite a few members, over 200 members now. Um, Barry's one of the founding members that we started working with a long time ago. But one of the values that we've always held very highly is just to be, to be open, to be honest, to be willing to kind of share with others. Because I think together, as you know, all of us are just trying to make it in this world as entrepreneurs, I think being able to share with others is possible awesome for everyone to be successful. And so very, not only is he on today to speak about success, but he's been willing enough to share some specific documents he uses, specific company metrics. Like there's quite a bit that you've kind of allowed us to use today to, to kind of talk about your story. So just thanks for that. And thanks for just being open to all this, man. It, it means a lot. And I think a lot of people get out of it, a lot out of it. So, cool. Oh, yeah, thanks. Good. I'm just going to add to you see guys. people succeed. Just a, just a quick disclaimer, guys. We're, we're going we're gonna to film this. So um, if, if any of you are kind of uncomfortable with that, you send us an email. That's, that's totally good. But we, we, we might use this for some marketing material later on on our YouTube. So I just wanted to let you guys know that we're going to record this as we go through. Yeah. So if you, if you don't want to be on video, uh, maybe don't be on video, but we're going we're gonna to probably use this for remarketing. If you want to be on video and you're good with that, Awesome. <laughs> You'll be famous. Delight. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, let's get rocking. Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about. When, when I isolated with Barry, we, we prepped for this call ahead of time and really just thought through like what are the three key things that really helped him be successful? And I think this is stuff that we talk a lot about BTA, it's a big part of our systems and what we do. 
Um, and I think for Barry, um, when we went through it with them, like these are the three things I think have really helped them and launch their business to the next level. You know, one is obviously helping them have a push with their vision with goals. They've really began with the end in mind, like a very clear intentionality behind everything they do every day. So the long term gets built. They built a pretty amazing team. Um, watching, you know, Barry kind of go from him and Scott and a few kind of, you know, young removal guys to a very dialed team, young, driven entrepreneurs that they've now sold franchises to. Like, he's got quite a neat story, but they've built an amazing team. So we'll speak a bit to how they did that. And then the backbone of everything is really just they, they've focused on systems. Like, they've taken themselves out of the day-to-day -day and they've focused on building business systems uh, versus just going doing all the work for everybody. And I think that's a pretty huge value. So we're going to get into each one of those three keys today, and that's kind of the topics of today. And really in light of Barry's story and just uh, kind of highlight specifically what you guys did to bring some tangibil tangibility to, to some, I'd say, just, you know, out there business concepts, right? Bring some ground, ground into them all. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so let's get into uh, a little bit. Actually, yeah, before we do that, I thought it'd be cool to get everyone's perspective. So there's a few of us on the line right now, and uh, Benji's kind of monitoring the chat window. But if everyone could just type in the chat window, I would love to hear what's been your biggest challenge when it comes to getting out of the daily grind. Um, so if everyone wants to just like, you see a little chat window in your control panel at the bottom. Um, Benji, maybe just chat in there, just say hi. We'll start blinking orange when you do that. Can you hear me? Oh, so, oh that's just yeah. you me, I think. Oh. Uh, yeah, go all panelists and then. Um, all right. So just where it's blinking orange, just type, I'd love to hear from you guys. What is the biggest challenge that you're facing? when it comes to getting you out of the daily grind, whether that's actually all being on the tools, whether that's being in charge of everybody and making all decisions in the office, uh, wherever you're at in business, what are some of the challenges you're finding when it comes to like actually pulling yourself out of the day to day and, and running it more of a business. So feel free to type in there a few things. You um, if you Danny, can come. you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, um, my name's Fernando. Um, we run right now. We're, kind of rebranding the company. It was New Millennium Northwest. We're based off of Seattle. Um, we started off mainly as a maid service, which um, right now we're kind of separating. We did a lot of multiple things under one company. Uh, we did maid service, window cleaning, pressure washing, soft washing. Um, I've been doing painting for the past 10 years. So right now it's just, we did a few things wrong that we're trying to figure out now and kind of rebrand everything and separate it because at the end of the day we don't we're not specific for one thing they call us and we're doing multiple things so we want to nail it down to what's more profitable but our, our problem currently is that we went the employee route and it wasn't really working um an hourly wage it seems like they're not motivated enough so i kind of started connecting with eric from painter choice and he talks a lot about subbing a lot of the work out. The problem now it's we get the subs. Um, I think the main problem is we don't have a proper system that we could follow. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of going and doing things as it's happening. But with summer coming on and painting being a seasonal thing, we're kind of left with subcontractors not showing up and doing what they're saying they're going to do. Right. So we're leaning more towards going into a contract deal type of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I know Eric's really big on doing 50% uh, the way I'm doing it just to retain subcontractors is you give me a bid and then I end up going with whoever I feel more confident with. Um, the problem is just kind of retaining employees and subcontractors i'm currently stuck with like five projects for this week and i'm putting 80 90 hours a week for the past four months just being stuck with not having a proper i think the main problem is just not having the right system to follow and kind yeah. of face it off it's people and systems man that's the whole game it's like how do you first find the right people but then once you have them how do you get the most productivity out of them and that's a good point like it's 
It's interesting too. I, I watch a lot of companies as they grow, they don't actually realize how much control they have over people's time. And when you look at one hour that goes by in a business, and if you have say 10 employees or 10 subcontractors working for you, and that one hour is a mess because you had a bad day or had a bad start or guys went to the wrong job or whatever it is, that's 10 hours gone in that one hour, 10 human hours, right? And how important it is for owners to start to build that system so that because it's not about you anymore. Like you can only impact one paintbrush at a time, right? But if you can build a great system, you can impact 10 paintbrushes all at once. So it's a good point, Fernando. I appreciate it. A couple other challenges here. Aaron's got hiring in systems. I know Aaron, we spoke a couple of weeks ago about uh, the, the labor shortage in, in your world. So I, I, I remember that well. And then for Steve, uh, yeah, we, we spoke a couple weeks ago too, actually. And for you, it was, it was um, some marketing stuff, getting some cold callers out, really just like generating the lead flow on the front end of the business to, to get your sales up. So cool. we're going to talk a lot about all those things. Sweet. All right, let's get into some of them. Um, so the first thing I thought I would share is uh, just this uh, concept of beginning with the end in mind. So really building a business with a lot of intentionality, because I think a lot of people get into business and they're like excited. They're like on their own now. They can do, make their own rules up. And if you don't have a plan as to where you're actually taking things, it can get messy real fast. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you on the line think this way, but like when you first started your business, there was all this excitement. You're like, what could possibly go wrong? This is awesome. And whether it's been a year or 10 years from now, late, later on, you're looking back and you're like, the hell happened? Like, this is not what I was planning when I originally wanted to start this thing. Maybe we're making money, maybe we're not, but man, I'm stressed out. I'm overworked. This is not the freedom I thought I would have, right? So we're going to talk a lot about how to have this relentless confidence, how to have a plan, have a rigorous priority management, like block schedule that really forces you to actually create that vision and get you guys back on track. Because I think that was, that can be one of the biggest things that people really mess up. Um, and what I wanted to run into the first piece of this was just a strategic plan, having something on one page that really defines all the things you're going for. And here's the cool thing. Barry literally shared with us his entire one page strategic plan with all of his numbers, which Barry, like, that's kind of incredible. And thank you for doing that. So like, here's, here's his stats. And what I thought would be cool is Barry, I just, I'd love you to just speak to this a bit. Like how did this help you in the pursuit of your goals as you go through the year? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of, it's funny because so that going back to that first point before, so having that kind of confidence to what you want to create in your life, like that's really the driving factor behind it. Like that's the, that's the whole purpose of, of getting into business because no one woke up one day and was like, you know, I want to work 90 hours a week. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to hang out with my friends. In fact, I don't even want them to call me anymore because I'm so busy. And on top of that, um, I, I don't want to start a family because I don't have time. And even if I have one, they won't see me anyways. So like, that's, that's not the goal here. The goal is to have time to leverage yourself so that you can create a very profitable business without being, you know, billed by the hour or anything like that. Um, and so, so getting really clear about what you want, because everyone's different. You know, we wanted to create a franchise model. That's not for everyone. Some people want to, you know, build a million or a $5 million business in their local market, make it profitable, put an amazing manager in place, and then kind of step back a little bit. Um, everyone's different. So knowing what you want, getting that vision really dialed in and put, put it on paper. It might change every year, but just, you know, take a minute to, or, you know, take half an hour to, to throw it down on paper and what you want. Because the point of that is so that now we can, now we know where we want to end up. Let's say that's like a three year plan kind of thing. I want to do X, X and X in three years. Now we can go back and we can build what's called a one page strategic plan. And this is actually my, if I'm being honest with you, my favorite time of the year, because it's when we can actually take that vision or dream or whatever we want to call it. And we can actually bring it to fruition because you know, whatever you're, you, you know, if we look in the, in the top section here, on the left side, it's kind of the far out stuff. In the middle, it's the year. What, what revenue do you want? What gross profit do you want? Um, how much overhead are you going to spend, which gives you X amount of net profit? Um, anything else you want to put in there, like, you know, you want to hire this key person in operations, whatever it be. Um, and then we, and then, so that usually stays the same. You adjust a little bit throughout the year because things happen and things change. But coming down to the column on the right, is is really that quarter so for the next three months what exactly do i need to do to hit that annual goal and the nice the thing i like about it the most is that it gives you so much 
control, not bad control, but good control over your business. So you really know um, what, what you're going to be, what, what you need to do to, to reach your goals for the year. Um, Cause that's a pretty, pretty damn good feeling to wake up on December 31st and go, yeah, we, we hit those targets. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the, the reason why we use it at 505 junk. Cool. It's good, man. Yeah. I, I mean, ultimately what this helps, and this is something we kind of introduced, actually, we're going to send everyone a template, not Barry's obviously template, but we're going to send everyone a template of this at the end of the call that you can use. Um, and this originally actually, I should give credit to a book called the Rockefeller habits, which, which speaks to what's called a one page strategic plan where you can have your entire vision and focus all on one page. Cause I think if it's in a massive business plan of like 27 pages that you give to a bank or 300 pages that you give to a bank, you never really look at it again. But by having something on one page, you can post up on the wall, you, your staff can all see, not only do you think through these things, but it creates clarity on exactly like what are the simple things that we're actually focused on every day that's going to take us to that year end place or that three year, three year from now place versus just getting distracted every day and reacting. So just one comment quickly, because I know it, it might look a little bit overwhelming. I mean, some of you have built a strategic plan before. Some of you have probably never done it ever. Um, this takes, I, I did the, the first one I did, I'd spent about four hours on it. Um, now we like to go away on a, on a little retreat kind of thing. We get out of town, my business partner and I, and spend a couple hours on it. Um, but, uh, or sp sorry, spend a few days on it. But anyways, it's, it, it doesn't have to be like a long drawn up process. You can do a great one page strategic plan in about four hours. Cool. Sweet. So that's the first point. So just thinking with the end in mind, actually physically writing it out so that you have a plan of action in place. Um, the next idea is, is taking this plan and starting to get it right down to like your priority management, your day to day. Um, and what I love, because Barry, this is the one thing we bump in with all the guys. Like it's great to think through all this stuff, but like how do you maintain balance in your day to day while still getting some of the big picture stuff done? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it kind of reminds me of that book, e -Myth, that whole concept of working on your business um, versus working in your business. And I don't think it makes sense to only ever work on your business because then you get completely disconnected with, with the staff, um, with your clients, with what the actual day-to-day -day of the business looks like. But the flip side of that is you don't want to, um, you know, let's say you own a painting business, you don't want to be painting homes um, 350 days out of the year because uh, it's going to be hard for you to, you know, look at, look at the other components of the business. And so that's where, you know, the idea of, of getting that separation is important. Um, so when we're setting goals, so, so back to that original question, Dan, you were asking, how do we fo how do we balance the time or what, what is it after we look yeah, at it? Yeah. It's like everyone, especially going to the summer, like everyone is so busy. So it's like, how are you guys, yeah. how have you guys in the past even like, have you guys managed the, like, the balance of this day-to-day -day stuff that's, especially when you're in it, when you're, when you're, mm. you know, when you're first getting going with us, you had all these other things that was consuming you. How did you start to pull away a little bit and, and create some time and space for the big picture? It was honestly, it was finding the right people. Because once we, it was, it was a balance. So first we, we, we had built a few systems in place. We basically, before meeting you guys, we, we, or Breakthrough Academy, we had looked at some of the, the tasks that were so recurring and we had a, a little kind of intro version of, a, of an operations manual. Um, but we didn't have the really important systems in place, like how to properly hire someone, what to say in an interview you know, how to onboard someone and train them and all this kind of stuff. And that was, that was it because, you know, to, to be honest, I mean, I, I went in the junk removal. I, I, did, I do it more because I miss it to be honest now, or I'm looking for some free furniture, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the honest, like, to be honest, I went in the truck about three times last year. And the reason why we were able to do that is because we put a lot of amazing systems in place and not only were we to, able to use those systems to hire and train people, we we're actually able to promote someone internally in our company to be the general manager um, of, of the company. So we're still working one-on-one -on -one directly with them, but now they're responsible for, you know, finding good people, bringing them in, training them, making sure the customer service is going well. So it was, it was a bit of a long road, but that, that was the end result. And, um, and, and and for those yeah. of those who have never like 
built any of this yet. They don't have a GM yet. They're, they're still kind of stuck. What, what advice would you give to them? They're just like, they're, they're out there doing it every day. What's the first thing? Well, you, you are the GM, so you don't need a GM. It would be a waste of money and a bad idea. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you're the, that role of GM is, is really, and I don't always like Sorry, just yeah. want to be clear. more for like, how do they create some space? Like, how do you, how do you get a few hours a week when you're just, gotcha. Um, I, I, I like to use just a, a simple calendar system, to be honest. So if I know I'm going to be out in the junk truck, say for eight hours in a day, then I'm just going to block that time off and there's nothing you can do about it. But if they're, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to, eventually you want to hire people. So you'll, you'll have to just make that space eventually, whether it's on a, you know, a Friday morning between seven and six o'clock and 8 a.m. Um, the idea is that you really want to understand where your time is being spent um, so that you can, so you can time block it into a calendar or a system um, and make sure that, you know, you've got a clear idea of what you're doing for the week. Cool. Sweet. Which is exactly what we're about to talk about. <laughs> Perfect. I just got Brennan's, Brennan put his phone on here, so it's uh, reverbing in my ear. Um, a sec here. So let's get into this. So this is generally, like, this is your block schedule, right? I think we, 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 we copied and pasted this for prep. Um, this is generally oh, yeah, there what, we go, right. Yeah, this is it. So this is what Barry's schedule kind of looks like. And I think what's important to highlight in some of these things is that you need to t have an actual block schedule for things, right? Like, you, if, if for those of you who do quotes, you probably block schedule time to quote do a quote with a customer. You probably block schedule time to, you know, I don't know, do certain things in the business. Take a block schedule if you don't ever use it and block schedule like five hours a week. I always recommend to guys to start to work on some of the day to day. And not that's that can involve a lot of things. I mean, that can involve sitting on your own and building out some Excel documents or building out a tracking form or tracking some of your financials. But that can also involve things like doing GSNR or goal setting with your staff and starting to hire the right staff and do interviews with people. And I'll even give a, a personal story. I remember just going back to the basics, like when I was in my first year, I ran a painting business. I had six people hired and I lost three of them in the first week. Cause to be honest, I kind of sucked as a manager that year, but I, instead of going out and just painting all these houses I had lined up and trying to be three painters, I, I actually pushed out a lot of my jobs and said, actually, I got to push back. I got a block schedule time to go hire three more. And I pushed out all my work by about two weeks and I got those other three guys back in place, um, three new painters, so that I could stay out of that day-to-day -day of being a painter for the company. And I think for a lot of people, when you're, when you're stuck in some of these positions and, and see these situations, just to make a decision, it's like, is this good for me for just today or is this actually gonna be good for me for the long-term? And starting to take at least five hours a week to do things that are more for your long-term benefit than just for your day-to-day -day problems, it'll really start to have a compounding effect over time, but it takes time. So. Um, anyways, this is Barry's schedule. Barry, any, any, anything that you just want to speak to this when it comes to block scheduling? Um, yeah, so I, I, I try and keep it as simple as possible. I'm colorblind, so the colors have to be very different. So that's why <laughs> Are I you colorblind? I don't know. I'm colorblind, yeah. I didn't know that. But, um, <laughs> so, so I guess we'll go with the green. Um, those are the, what I like to call the rocks, but really all that means is it's important. So these are things where um, we can pick a few things like preparing for the week. I put two hours in that. That's really important for me because if I don't prepare for the week, then I'm just going to dive in head first Monday morning and just start working. And, you know, we, I want to make sure that, cause I value my time a lot. We've got 15 or 20 people here. So I, we need to make sure that what, not only what I'm doing is important, but I also need to make sure that what every single person is working on is going to have the most impact for the business. A um, couple other quick things here, like building a referral process. That's massive. If we can just turn every client into two clients, that's going to double our business. I mean, I know that's far-fetched, but um, having a system or a process in place is, is huge there. Um, lots of sales blocks. Um, this opportunity hunt is where we just bring everyone together and we're just literally cold calling all the, all, for about three, four hours straight. Um, BTA webinar. Um, and then uh, this lunch and learn is just uh, a, a big, uh, big lunch and learn. So another sales thing we're doing with a, a property manager. Um, so the idea here is that I try and free up space for much, as much green time as possible. The red is my personal stuff. I know there's not a lot on there, but I also don't like scheduling too much personal stuff because it gives you a bit of variance. Because if all you ever do is like, you know, rigid with your schedule, then it's kind of gets a little boring. But the idea here is that you're, we're, we're using the schedule for two reasons. One is to make sure we're creating enough time because we're all born with 24 hours in this day. And the other one 
is that we are putting the most important things for the week or even as far as the month, um, which is actually just pulled from the strategic plan. So in that strategic plan, if it says, you know, you need to do 200,000, 500,000, million dollars this quarter, whatever the number is, you're going to break down that revenue and then make sure that you have enough people focused on sales and marketing tasks um, to, to hit the targets. Cool. Yeah. And just, just to recap, because this is kind of uh, capping off this first point of like uh, beginning with the end in mind, we've kind of got a vision. We've built this vision into a real like written down plan. And actually we're going to give everybody this kind of template so you guys can start to write down your plans. You've then broken that down even further so you can figure out based on that big picture plan, what are the kind of the weekly tasks you need to do? And then you've built it into your calendar, essentially, and made time for it. Is that it? Any other points on that? It's good? No, honestly, I like to keep it simple. That's it. Start with the big picture, one year, break it down to the quarter, break it down to the week, throw out your calendar and hold yourself accountable. Or get a coach that will hold you accountable for you. Some son of a bitch like me. <laughs> anyway it's good cool let's keep rolling um so next thing we were going to talk about uh and get into with barry is just building the right team so it's come up a couple times i'd say for most people this is probably the biggest and, and biggest hurdle for most people to face is like how the frick do i find good people that i can actually count on and then rely on that can build the business with me um i think for most companies they react, right? So it's like you get to a point where you're like, hey, we need like six guys, you know, in the next two weeks because we got tons of work that just came in. Or, oh crap, I don't have any time. I need a project manager in the busyness of your day-to-day -day schedule. You're trying to find a guy to help take over some of your tasks. And you're too willing to take on like a B or a C level candidate because you don't even have the time to find an A level candidate. And you maybe you in your own personal world just feel it's not possible to find those types of people. So we're going to go into some stuff that BTA kind of teaches and as well as that Barry's kind of used to really find like a caliber people that you can rely on that can build with you long-term and you can actually build a company out of them. Because if you build a company out of a bunch of like we call dusters, then you can't really go anywhere. Right. But if you build a company of like solid individuals that care about the brand, have similar core values, have a, have a natural like preference and ability to execute in the roles that you put them in, you can take this thing to wherever you want. Um, so Barry, I just, I, I'd love to hear from you even just like some stories of like some of the best guys you've ever hired and how they've helped the company and even just some of the worst hires you've ever hired and how they've hindered your, your growth. Do you want worst or best first? Uh, <laughs> let's go worst first. Uh, worst yeah, let's first. Go worst first. <laughs> worst first. Get it out of the way. I think we all have, a, we all have our stories. I'm sure everyone in here has their own stories. Um, my worst was, it was just kind of a classic. I mean, we, it, we were in a very fast growth pace or sorry, phase, I guess at the time we we're growing from, this is in 2016 from, you know, 480,000 to just over a million dollars in sales. And you can imagine from a production standpoint, because we need two people in every truck, you know, we just got to, we were just kind of bringing people in and we definitely, you know, made exceptions on our interviewing and our values and didn't follow the system. And it was really just, if you, the philosophy that we didn't say, but what I think we were going through is like, if you have two legs and a brain, then welcome to 505 junk. <laughs> uh, and that really came back to bite us. Some we, some we lucked out. I, I wouldn't praise anyone for, for those hires in, in hindsight because it was purely chance. Um, but others, you know, we, we had some theft. We had some, uh, some, some people were on drugs. And it was, just some, it was just terrible all around. And so we, we had to go that year. We fired quite a few people. We haven't had that issue at all since then. Um, despite growing fast, it doesn't make a difference because there's companies out there that are hiring hundreds of people a day. You just need to have the right systems, block schedule it like we were talking about before, and make sure that you know we're we're going we're hiring very slowly, so you don't have to so you don't have to fire quickly. Um, now the flip side of that is that we have a lot of success stories. I think. Um, most of the people in our company at all levels, whether we're in manager roles or in the sales center, uh, everyone's kind of started with us from the ground up. So we're not, we don't really necessarily hire based on skill set. I mean, what are you going to hire a general manager? Gen the word general, the generalization kills clarity. So how are you going to find one anyways? Um, so we we're big on just finding the right people, bringing them into the company and giving them every single tool they need to be successful. And once they master that role, we'll plan out what the next role is for them. Um, I guess two quick stories. One would be, um, 
One is Alex. So he was, we hired him four months into business in 2012. And, um, and he came on as a, as a truck team driver. I've actually got this awesome photo that I wish I had. I, there's a picture of him, young Alex kind of sleeping in the back of the truck. It was just a pickup truck, my business partner and I, and he's kind of sleeping in the back. I don't know if he had maybe a bit of a late night the night before or something like that. Um, but we knew from the beginning that this guy was going to be an absolute rock star. And so fast forward to today, he went from our truck team uh, driver to our trainer, to our team lead where he's running the crews um, to the operations manager role. And this is his first year in the general manager role where he's taking on more of a, a sales um, role and he's responsible for generating the revenue and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a big win. Um, and then the similarly, so this is kind of proof that, you know, you, you got to try different avenues. So we tried indeed advertising to hire someone. Um, we had a few misses and then finally this person, um, he, he was looking to, um, get a long haul trucking job, which is completely different to what we do. But long story short is he called us, we went through a conversion call, which is a system we built through breakthrough Academy. Um, it's about 15 minutes. We asked them all the key questions to, to make sure it's worth our time to bring them in for an interview and worth their time as well. Turns out that he was interested in, in the role, even though he wasn't going to be driving trucks across Canada. Um, he came in, it was a great fit. He was an amazing employee for two years. And at the start of 2017, when we took our team on a little uh, vacation retreat up in Squamish, we announced that we're going to start partnering with franchisees. And he walked up to me and he's like, I'm going to buy your first franchise. And three, no, it must have been November of that year, he was our first franchise that we signed. So he now went from um, moving from moving from India to Vancouver, wondering what the heck am I going to do with my life to starting as a truck team driver at 505 Junk. And then within two years, he now owns his own business and, and it's profitable. He's paying himself a good income and it's still small, but he's four months in and he's already generating about 20,000 in revenue a month. So it's off to, off to a good start. He's a good man. He came and picked up my hot tub last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I appreciated that. Yeah. So, so let, let me get into some of the specifics just so you guys can see and kind of understand exactly what Barry was doing. Um, so one of the first things we do with a lot of our members is we help them recruit. So we help them understand who they're actually looking for first. And all of you need to flip from like, I need somebody to, I need to sell my business to the right type of person and flip from like, I'm a recruiter to like, I'm actually doing a bit of sales and marketing first. So profile your ideal candidate. What are their strengths, their weaknesses, their core values, their wants, their needs, what excites them? How do they want to feel about their work? And, and I think Barry took time to understand this about his people to find guys like Harjo, right? From there, draw up an ad that sells that position. This is an example of BTA's ad, but we needed another Caitlin, um, who's actually Brennan, who's sitting right beside me here. We just hired him a few weeks ago. But he's been an instrumental part to our business because we're growing out of control. But if we get the wrong fit, we're screwed. So we need to sell to find that right person. We, we profiled Caitlin. We then drew up an ad that speaks to the Caitlins of the world. So this is like an example of that ad that really, if you read through it, it's like, this is Caitlin. I mean, you guys don't know her probably, but she's a super motivated, detail-oriented person. So it's like, are you a super motivated, detail-oriented person? You thrive in a fast-paced, ever-working, change, or ever-changing work environment where problem-solving is the norm? Are you energized in a service-oriented, sales-focused environment? Do you want to have the freedom to work anywhere in North America? If, if yes, you know, read on. Like we're really speaking to that person so they can self-identify, right? And then from there, we're interviewing them on these specific traits. I mean, it's so important to basically start to, start to look at people as, I need to interview you on your actual like personality or your, your preferences and abilities over just your skill, right? Especially when we're desperate and hiring, a lot of people just go like, do you have a steel-toed pair of boots and a heartbeat? Get on site, right? Versus like, do you have attainment? Do you have tenacity? Do you have the ability to work extremely hard when we need you the most? Or are you going to crumble and give up? Right? So here's some of the stuff we look for. So this is like an interview chart, which looks at attainment, which is the preference to set and hit goals. And this is built inside of people naturally. And by understanding this at a quite a high level, you can start to really predict people's future performance based on their past behavior. Um, and as, as, yeah, Barry, if you want to speak to this, but I mean, you've used this interview format, but like, how do you find it and how has it changed the company a little bit going from hiring for just skill to hiring more for like personality? 
I think the, the, the long story short is that it, it gives you, it gives you uh, a system to follow when you're interviewing because at the end of the day, you know, no one's born to be a good interviewer. It's a skill set that gets adapted and, and learned over time. And, you know, if you're following the same system, if you've thought through the right questions to ask that are going to find, pull out the right or wrong traits in someone, um, you just get better and better and better at it. So you could tell, like, you know, if you're looking for attainment, um, this is, these are, these are, I, I wouldn't change a thing. These are great examples of ways to see if someone has, you know, a high level of attainment or not. So it's, it's, it's all about the system. Cool. Chris, you said you had some thoughts. Did you want to share them? Feel free if you want. We can unmute them. We'll, we'll do it at the, at the Q&A at the end. We were just chatting on the chat box. So we'll, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. All right. Any other points on this, Barry? Just on, on recruitment? I think, honestly, it's, it's, it's all about preparation. That's, that's the main thing. Because you, you, my, my take on luck, and you often hear people, oh, you're so lucky you found this person. But <laughs> luck, is, luck is when when opportunity meets preparation. And at the end of the day, if we're prepared – AKA the system here, um, or, a, a, you know, the right questions and systems for you. Um, and then we create the opportunities by getting into specific ads, whether it's Craigslist, indeed, employee referral programs, et cetera. That's when, that's when the magic starts to happen. So that's, that's what I'd say about that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And, and just to recap with you guys. So we were just talking a little bit about, oop, let me pull it back up here. Um, there we go talking a little bit about the, the second point here, which is like finding the right team. And, and what I would say for a lot of people, like, yes, like build the right job ad. Yes, take time to interview the person. Like, here's some systems to help you with this. But if you're constantly being like, we have two weeks to hire somebody, I don't know, like, you know, we need them now. Versus in January, building a bit of a strategic plan, figuring out and thinking through what key roles are we hiring for in the next kind of fiscal year? And when roughly do we need those roles? So we need a sales guy, in like the month of February, we might need a, a project manager in September so we can get them trained for next fiscal year. We might need 10 technicians starting May 1st. Well, if we can plan that ahead of time, let's start recruiting in January for all of those roles. So it's not so like, just like we need someone now and you've increased automatically the pool of people because the timeline's much bigger now. And just very simply, just changing your connotation to recruiting as a reactionary thing to it's a more proactive, well thought through process, that in and of itself will give a lot of you guys the freedom to get the person you actually want versus being like, well, this is the best guy of the stack of resumes we've got in the last two weeks, so let's put him in and see how he does, right? So, cool. Um, Benji, any other thoughts from you? You've been yeah, I just, I like just thinking through that, like, uh, I think what's missing for a lot of this is like, you think, think for you guys, how seriously you take marketing and sales, the time you devote to it, the effort you put into it, this, like the systems that you've developed around it and the way you have a lead, go to a, an estimate, go to a follow-up, go to a closed job, to a produce job. Like there's so much focus that we put into that end of our business. And yet when, when we kind of dig into like what you're doing for recruiting, it's this incredibly secondary like C priority at the bottom of the list when you compare it to sales and marketing. And whether we want to admit this or not, we are all doing service-based businesses that are essentially like different iterations of the same thing. So our entire competitive advantage is in our people. Why then is our recruiting as a function and as, a, as an activity in our business pretty near the bottom of the pile, right? We're scanning through resumes in the lineup for Starbucks or while we'll stop at a red light. Meanwhile, we'll commit an entire day of the week to just like go meet, meet potential clients. So I just like net net on all of this is like we need to like completely have a shift in mindset in terms of how seriously we take recruiting because that is our business, right? We, we run people-based businesses. These aren't, these aren't tech companies. We're not design firms. We are in the business of like selling the service of other people. So I think just bottom line, take it more seriously. You're muted. There you go. Danny, Danny, Bo, Banny, unmute oh, yourself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, one, one thing just to back that up, Benj, is like, it's interesting. In 2008, the biggest like lack of, of what we all needed was work, right? Everybody was like, I got to market, I got to sell, I got to get ahead. I mean, like, it's hard to get work. So what did we do? We piled tons of time, money, and effort into marketing and sales, which is awesome and great. 
But if a lot of you are starting to realize at this point, I actually have more work than I even know what to do with. Start to look at how much time and money that you're spending on marketing and sales right now and reallocate some of that into recruitment because that's now the finite resources is people. It's not necessarily just work anymore. And if you've got something, I've seen this on people's books, like forty to $100,000 or some even just $20,000 on say like AdWords to get work and you're spending $500 a year on recruiting, you got to look at like, maybe I should move some of that money into that category of recruitment, put out more money into the ads because that's where I'm struggling. And that's actually costing me a lot of money right now. If you actually calculate how much an employee makes you per day and realize every single day, how many, how many days they're not working for you because you don't have them hired yet. That is a much more costly thing than spending some money on ads. So Barry, any, any final thoughts on recruitment? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I mean, you guys, you guys touched on it a lot. I think that the main thing is, is the one thing that I would really emphasize going back to that connection of, of preparation and, and, um, and opportunity is that, you know, you're, you really want to make sure, you know, generally speaking, not exact dates, but the key dates for when you're going to have to hire, because a lot of the home service businesses or service business in general is going to go through this, you know, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, or whatever your seasonal swing is. And you, you, you do want to be prepared. You don't want to say, you know, come June 1st that you have to hire 10 people. You want to say on February 1st that we're slowly starting to trickle our recruitment advertising campaigns uh, and bringing on the right people, hiring people, saying we're, you know, hiring people or, or interviewing months in advance, saying we're going to hire in two months. If that doesn't work for them, no problem, on to the next person. Now we're hiring in a month kind of thing. So the preparation is huge. Having the right system in place is huge. Um, and then also the right systems in place to asking the, for asking the people the right questions so that when you have one spot and five people, you're picking the right person at the end of the day. Cool. Sweet. All right, let's move into number three. Uh, I get it. There we go. So number three, building the right system. And this is kind of the backbone, um, I would say, of a lot of, of what we do at BTA, a lot of what you, Barry, have been spending years building. But essentially, it's the concept that your business is like a machine, right? If you think about it, <coughs> you as the owner should be turning one crank. And that crank should turn three different cogs. It should turn an administrative cog, a production cog, and a sales cog. And those should be people. Those should be real people. You should have a budget that you can tell exactly how much your machine's going to do in a year. You should have job cost cards to predict how efficient every job can produce, how efficient your machine is. You should have a sales and production plan so you can give goals to everyone in your organization that's broken down to weekly goals so everyone knows exactly where they need to be week to week to execute on your end. <clears throat> you should have an org structure that defines that clearly, right? So a lot of people, the owner kind of does a little bit of everybody's job and they don't have a specific job description or an org structure to follow so they get sucked into everything. So having clarity so everyone knows exactly what they need to do and then finally with that, you can drop job descriptions where everyone is very clear on what their job is, what it isn't, how they pass what they do off to the next person, and that machine can start to churn and start to move. Um, and I would, I would love to know, Barry, like for you, like what is really important to you uh, when it comes to doing this and, and how did you kind of start doing this in the beginning when it's first came like building a system? So that's, that's a great question. And it's, um, it's a bit of a beast to dissect, but to keep it simple, we, again, we started with the end in mind. So we asked ourselves the question, what does this business look like when great people know exactly what they're doing and they're performing at a very high level and everything's successful? What does that look like? And so we decided that there's a whole bunch of things we need to systematize. And what we did is, we wrote out a bit of a table of contents kind of thing, but the main part is, is we started with the, the highest um, recurring job. So if you're in painting, you know, what systems do you need to, to write out? So when you're training, um, you know, your, your, your painters um, know what they're doing. In junk removal, it started with how to properly load the truck, what to, to do when you're calling a client to say you're en route. Um, what does onboarding a new employee look like? And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the end goal was that we wanted to be able to give ourselves who were trained. So my business partner and I, who were, who were doing the training, 
Um, we wanted to give ourselves the ability to, to keep a streamlined system in place so that everyone was kind of acting in the same manner. And now we can give that same system to someone else to do the same thing. Um, yeah, Danny, I don't, I don't know. I know it's a bit of a, it's a big topic, the, get, getting the, the systems in place. Um, what specifically did you have in mind when you, when you wanted to talk about, um, did, did maybe a little bit about the, like think, the think, timeline of what it took to systematize our business in yeah, full so kind of thing? What is the reality? The reality. Because I think a lot of people okay, so, this and they're like, okay, I've tried some of these things, but it's kind of jumbled in their own brain. It's not fully complete. Like what is the reality? Of yeah. Yeah. Because you, you guys have done a phenomenal job of this and, and to the point of literally you sell this now, this is your franchise system that you sell. So like, what is the reality of actually doing this properly? Okay, so the reality is it's not easy. Um, it takes time. Um, but the, the, the other reality, the, the more harsh reality is what if you don't do this? And so on the entry level, you might get poor performing employees. You might have people that have no clue what the heck they're doing. Long term, um, it doesn't matter if you're in franchising, selling your business, or putting a manager in place to run your business. Um, you need systems. No one's going to buy a business that isn't systematized. No one's going to buy a franchise that isn't systematized and no manager is going to want to come and work with you. And they say, what am I doing? And you say, I don't know. Cause I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so that's the reality of it. So if your time writing systems is not fun, I spent about eight months writing a 250 page operations manual um, so that we can sell franchises. You guys don't need to do that. You, I mean, if you want to franchise, you, you might have to do a variation of it. Um, but the point is, is that, was it fun? No, absolutely not. I'd much rather write a book about, I don't know, it's something other than how to systematize a junk removal company. But um, the end result was tied to a much larger inspiration, which is applicable to anyone that owns a business. And again, the three basic ones are stay local and put a great person in place to run it for you. Scale it through franchising or through corporate growth, which requires systems or sell it. Those are really the three like ultimate congratulations. You've, you've, you've freed yourself entirely from your business so you can focus on doing whatever you want to do. Um, but you need systems for all of it. Cool. Sweet man. So let's get into Just to give, I, you probably won't do this because you're a modest guy, but I am <laughs> going to be honest. Um, BTA has an incredible platform of pre-made systems. Um, someone named Aaron Curvis, who works for BTA, does an incredible um, job of making kind of broad systems. And then we took a lot of that and just kind of rewrote it, rebranded it. They're kind of like white labeled almost. And then you can just, we just roll it into our model and then just make a few tweaks. Because one of the hardest part I found is that writer's block thing where you just need to get started. Um, so this gives you something to work with and it's nice and organized. And anyways, I just wanted to bring that up as well. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, it's good. We worked very hard. <laughs> to help make it easier. Good. Cool. Um, so let's take a look at, at, at this piece by piece. So let's start with just with like the budgeting side, the financial side. So ultimately to, to build a system, you need to start with, I would say arguably the, the dollars, making sure you have a business plan that actually makes sense. So you want to study your 2017 results to benchmark 2018, right? So you want to look at what your revenue sources were, what your variable expenses were, what your gross profit margins were, what your overhead costs were, what your net profit was, and use that to benchmark a plan for next year. And it's so important that you sit down and look at the numbers before you just go, we're going to scale and build this big system. It's like, does it even financially make sense? And ben, Barry, I'd love to hear from you too. Like, what are some, just what are some things that sparked maybe some changes or the way that you kind of do what you do every day right now based on the numbers that you saw in the business year over year. Could have been this year, maybe a few years ago, but what are some like things that, that just looking at the numbers and analyzing them before you build out a, a year plan that's changed your behavior or changed the way you do things? Well, it, it started with actually tracking them. So that, that helped. Um, but in the beginning, um, you know, we didn't have the, the data to collect because we weren't, we weren't really doing a good job of tracking it. Um, and so that was the big thing is that in order to make good decisions, as managers of the company, we needed to know the numbers to impact kind of the activity. So if, if someone says to us, hey, we could rebuild your website for five grand, I'm like, sounds good. Do we need a new website? Do we have the five grand? Is it in the budget? 
And so what we do now is it's very simple. We've taken all the data from previous years. We've taken some averages or gross profit margin in our business. Everyone's different, but our variable costs include um, the labor to drive the truck, the cost to dump the material at the transfer station, and fuel. And now we have franchise fees in there as well, but let's leave that out. And so now we have all these, these percentages. And we, we, I like to keep it very simple. Um, we have a tab for our budget for the year, month by month. This is just an Excel document. Um, we have a tab for our actuals for the year, month by month. And then we have a tab for the trending. So not what we thought we were going to do. We leave that there because then we learn how good we were at predicting. Then we've got the, the, the actual, so we plug in the actual numbers that come from our you know, accountant or QuickBooks or whatever system you're using. So anyways, it's, the, the, importance is, is the, the importance behind it is really just kind of being able to make those important decisions by knowing exactly your numbers. That's, that's the key there. Yeah, so here's, here's an example we threw up for everyone to kind of see. One of the things we help people with is that budgeting, but we also break it down to job costing, right? So every job that gets produced you kind of want to make sure you're actually making money on it. And it's, you know what, if you don't and you, you hit some bad ones, it's just important that you recognize that early, right? So you can see this kind of example where it's like debt job, Becker job, Sandler job, like looks like 38, 46, 43%. Like you can see the percentages off to the side. And then you see this Miller job, the 12%. And you look like, what, what happened? And you look at the subcontractor costs are at 46% and everything else came in at 22 to you know 15% or so. You're starting to see a pattern. You're like, okay, what happened on this job? How do we stop this from happening moving forward? So build a plan, but then also monitor your plan as you go and make sure you're actually making money along the way. And I think this is actually a template we're going to give everybody so you guys can start to, if you're not already, start to track your budget and then start to track your job costs as well. Um, anything to speak to this, Barry? Like, like just tracking job by job, or you guys do, I think, day by day or truck by truck. But Yeah, we do it, we do it by day by truck. And we just set up like a super simple form on our website for the truck teams to just grab their tablet and plug in the revenue, the cost, um, their name, and um, it automatically calculates the gross profit. I'd be happy to help if anyone wants to set something like that up as well, or um, B BTA has the, you know, the systems as well, so it's perfect. Um, but the idea is that we now have our truck team members calculating their gross profit on the day they don't necessarily care about the numbers too much, but they just know what a win is. And when, and when they come back to the office at the end of the day, they're like, you know, Oh, like what was your gross profit? And our goal is 45%. Um, after our, I guess it's technically 58% with the franchise fees out, but everyone's coming in. They're like, Oh, I only got 55. Like today suck kind of thing. And someone else is like, Oh, I got 65%. And they're getting really excited about it. And so now we've, we've actually seen a 13% increase in gross profit, which is huge because that directly correlates with net profit um, since we started implementing this after working with, with ETA. Um, so that's the big one. Next, I think what we want to do now that we're comfortable with where gross profit is at, we can actually incentivize maybe our truck team employees to make some money um, based on their, on their daily production. So it's been pretty cool. Good man. Yeah, we'll get into that too. One thing to add to this, one really important point that all you guys have touched this, the cadence is the most important thing here, right? If you're getting data on a yearly basis and just looking at a PNL to find this stuff out, number one, you can't see this because it's all clustered together. And number two, it's too little too late, right? It's, it, you, all that stuff is well behind you and you're now on to the next thing. Whereas if you can get into the rhythm and the ritual of doing this on a weekly or at the very least a monthly basis, you have, you have data that's much more recent and you can take action on it. You see the patterns that you miss on the year end clump and you actually have the time to get in there and make changes. So it's really, really important. Yeah, the system is great, but getting the habit in your calendar, going back to that block scheduling stuff to have this in there every two weeks on Fridays, I do my job cost cards and I see the red flags and I, and I build a strategy to fix them. Yeah, awesome, man. Sweet. So just to give you guys some awareness of some of the numbers we track with all of our members. So everybody has what we call like a dashboard where all their numbers are coming to them and giving them kind of like a view of exactly what's going on. So we look at dollars sold, average job size, how many estimates they've done, what their closing ratio is, their lead slippage, their, how many leads they generated. And then on the production side, we look at dollars produced, AR, labor productivity, hours produced, and materials and how, if they're on budget or not. 
And what this allows us to do, and, and so you might know what some of these metrics are, you might you know, not know what all of them are. We can explain these if we go into another session, but they give you kind of like the gauge of how your business is doing on all levels. So sales, production, profitability, you can start to really measure what's going on. And when you see any indicator, like say you're, it's like a vehicle with an oil gauge, you see it dropping, you can do something about it quick versus driving that vehicle into the ground and finding out at the end of the year, you totally fucked your whole engine because you weren't paying attention. Right? So this is, this is, a, there's a, there's a format to how we do this. We have a basic a technology that helps us do this with all of our members, but all of our members have live data, how they're doing in all areas of their business. And then when we're coaching and developing them, this gives them pretty real raw understanding of what to actually do differently. Um, there are any stories around this is like any insights of doing this has given you just having that dashboard and just what you guys have done as a result. Um, yeah, so I've got a, I've, I've got a not so pretty story actually, which is great because the end result is a little bit prettier, but, um, when we did our budget, naturally we know what we're, what kind of revenue we're looking to do month by month. Um, and we, we, it was actually just this year, we started to see it slip, not too much, but just a little bit. And the, we, we've been experiencing very high growth over the last two years, 100% and then 50%. And then this year we're planning for another 40%. Um, and so we were growing, but it wasn't at the rate we were anticipated. And anyway, so these having all this information and numbers, like I had to seriously deep dive our business to, be, to figure out what the heck was going on here. And after about three months, um, we went into it and we, we, we pulled out because we track all of our, our lead sources. So we know our, our total revenue on the year is broken down per marketing source. So we know what marketing campaign um, develops how much revenue. And we noticed that Google was, was dropping Google AdWords. So I don't know if any of you do use Google AdWords or search engine optimization, but that's a key driver for us to get new business. And so we looked at it and we went back and forth and it was the stupidest little thing. We had to click, we had to click on in this little Google analytics thing because the long story short without getting into technicalities is that Google analytics couldn't read what was happening on our website. And that was negatively impacting our AdWords campaign and not bringing new clients to us. So we made that change and that was only a week ago and we've just been stacked or all of our trucks are busy full time nonstop right now. Bit of a seasonal swing as well. A little bit of, call it luck but knowing that data like if we didn't make that change could have could have could have gotten pretty nasty would, would you been able to have found that if you weren't on top of your numbers like would you be able to actually like isolate what the thing was if you didn't have a grip on this stuff no we get we get revenue from like honestly 10 to 15 different sources of marketing from like right. google to cold calling to like we do direct mail campaigns to all the homes like so on and so forth so without knowing which campaigns are bringing in which revenue, I don't know which marketing is working. And I don't know. They always say 50% of your marketing works. The good marketers know which 50%. Um, and so we found out Google has worked for us for like six years. But when it started to go down, we could stop that and go, hold on, Google, start working again. And then now it's going back up again. Cool. Cool. Hey, man. Thanks for sharing. And, and I'm sure a lot of you probably have some stories like this or some of you have tracked numbers more than others, but I couldn't put more precedence on the fact that like to sit down and figure out where you're at, where you're going, and then to track what's actually happening along the way gives you a ton of confidence and a ton of control and, and you won't make as many mistakes. But it's very dangerous, right? As you throttle up a business and you're going up past a million bucks, you know this stuff or you can crash and burn fast. So it's good. And this is like we're talking about later today, but this is a big part of what we do at BTA. So let's keep rolling. Uh, this is an example of a sales plan. We're going to cover it for now. It's kind of into a few other things. Um, tracking your numbers. So these are some of the examples of softwares and systems that we recommend all day, every day to people to track their business. Everyone's a little different, but for accounting, QuickBooks is probably like the, the, the standard, I would say. Um, accountants like Sage a little better. I think it just works better for that, what, they're, what they need. But QuickBooks and Sage are two that I would highly recommend. If you're running like a service business like Barry is, he used Vonigo and I'll let him speak to that a little bit, but that's really good for service companies. If you're doing roofing or painting, Job Nimbus is really good. Um, if you're doing renovations, Co-Construct is really good or Builder Trend. Um, there's a few really good ones out there for different industries. If you're doing landscaping, um, LMN, Landscape Management Network. Um, if you're doing landscape maintenance, uh, Service Autopilot is extremely good. 
So if you don't have a CRM system, there's some ones for different industries, but things I really recommend you check out. On top of that, if, if some of these CRM systems you're using don't have native time tracking apps, so that's basically allowing your guys to log in online and offline, uh, sorry, log into their job sites through their phone. So you can tell where they are at all times and they can log their hours digitally. You can then tag those hours to the job or even to parts of the job that they're working on so you can see productivity. You should use a time tracking app. So something like exact time is a big one or humanity or T sheets. And if you don't have one of those, those would be good ones to look into. And then finally, what do you do with all this data is you put it into a KPI tracker. So it's basically Oh, Yar, Yar, I'm gonna meet you. There. <laughs> um, if you don't have a KPI tracker, it's basically a thing that allows you, like we were just talking about, to have a dashboard where all your numbers are in one place. You can see your financials, your production, your sales, and you can see if you're ahead or behind on goal. So we have that. So we built one, and if you're interested in using it, it's something that we really, I'd say, lean on to help coach all of our members. It's a big thing that we supply. So we take all the numbers from all these different systems and put them into one place. So you have a dashboard now to run the company. Um, Barry, you, you took a lot of time building into Vonigo. Do you want to speak just briefly, like what, what are the tough parts and just like the, the good and the bad of, of, of getting involved in building a CRM system to the level that you've done it? Yeah. Each, each one of these, like even QuickBooks online, I think every, unless you start with it, you know, every, everything takes a little bit of time to implement. Vonigo is a CRM software. Um, that, that works very well for us. And even the, the master business plan is, oh, it's, it's more, it's quicker to integrate, um, but everything takes a little bit of time. And I, and I totally appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to just say, well, I'd rather be up selling than, than to start, you know, tracking your numbers per se, but something like Vonigo, um, it took us maybe a month to really do it in full and not a, you know, I'm not talking eight hours a day month, but um, it takes time. It absolutely takes time. But the end result is that it makes your business so much more smoothly operating, um, more scalable if you're interested in scaling out your business. Um, and it gives you all the numbers and the reporting that you need to make the important decisions. Um, so, Actually, thanks to Vonigo, we could tell that our Google results were down because in Vonigo, um, every account gets attached, it has a lead source attached to it. And as that account generates revenue over time, that lead source gets credited for that revenue. Um, so it takes time, it, it, you know, but mo all of these companies here, I think Vonigo might charge a little bit for it, but a lot of them will just, they just want you on their software. So they'll, they'll do it for you for, for free. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure too much about the CRM ones, but, um, even if they charge you, it's, it's well worth the, the thousand bucks or whatever it is to get a nice CRM system set up. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what do you do with these numbers? Well, this is, this is the next point is we were talking, we were alluding to it a little bit before, but you use these numbers so that you can now hold your staff and your team accountable to the key numbers that they're actually in charge of. Um, so Barry, I don't know if you want to speak to this, but like what changes, like, have you made to the business when it comes to this kind of stuff and how has it actually changed your team's dynamic? I'm actually working on this right now. Um, and the reason why I'm working on it is not because we don't have one, but because it's always changing. And that's the whole, that's the whole point of creating one in the first place is to do a bit of an inventory of what you currently have. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a solopreneur, maybe it's not as relevant, but if you have anywhere from, you know, four or five to a hundred staff, I mean, obviously anything more than five staff, every single company on earth will have an organizational chart if you're in the hundred plus. But um, the idea is that people have very clear accountabilities. They know exactly what they need to do. They know what success looks like. Um, and they also have the person that they can work with. So if they have questions um, to do their job properly, um, whatever, some values, questions, stuff like that. They know who exactly to speak to. Um, this changes all the time, especially if you're growing quickly. If, you're, if your revenue stays stagnant and your, your, your people are the same year over year, then yeah, it's going to stay the same. But um, if you're putting you know, more people in place, then it, it's important to always stay on top of this and make sure your team knows exactly what they need to do at any given moment. Oh, totally. and, and it's interesting too. Like if you, if you're saying to somebody, Hey, you're in charge of like taking care of production, they don't really understand what that means. 
until you say you're in charge of $1.4 million produced at a 43% gross profit margin, and the customer rating has to come in at about a 9 out of 10 rating. And based on all these things, I can tell every week if you're doing your job or not. And now, yeah, that literally what you just said is the best part is that even if you go on a month long vacation and you just have a phone call with your say operations manager once a week, as long as the, as long as he's producing the revenue produced at 43% and the quality cards are coming at nine out of 10 and all the production staff are happy and well trained, nothing else matters. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Who cares if they have 40 emails or that they had a typo in a, letter or whatever it doesn't doesn't matter um so that's that's the main part there is that not only do they know exactly what they're, they're doing you don't have to micromanage them anymore mm. because those four key principles those four key deliverables um are the most important ones and you both define that and agreed on it yeah, yeah. And, and what's interesting about this is, let's go back to the beginning of today's talk where it's like we're taking time to get the strategic plan built we're then building out from there like a good recruiting plan to find good people we're then using that recruiting plan to kind of figure out, okay, what are all the numbers that we're going to hold people accountable to? And now we can build an org structure where everybody speaks the same language. Everyone's working on the same goal because we can track it as a, as a company. We know where we're going, right? How many companies have no idea what their, their year in revenue even is? So, I mean, a lot of you hopefully do, but some of you guys don't. And that's dangerous because you can't hold anyone else accountable to anything either. But the minute you have clarity on all these things, you can see here as an example, it's like you've got, your company trying to hit 1.25 at a 40% gross profit margin. You're bumping the goal up a little bit for your sales and operations team, but they're trying to hit 1.4 at a 43% margin. Your sales guy is trying to book 1.4, and we realized through the, the, the tracking system we have that we have to do 580 quotes. We're going down the line, we see these project managers. They've got to produce this work, and we know that the amount of hours required to produce these dollars, we figured out is about 30,000 hours. So we split it between two crews, 15,000 hours each. Right now, everybody can be aligned on the same goal, but in light of what they're directly able to make impact on. And you don't have to be the conduit telling everybody to work harder, please show up, please do this, because the numbers will tell them. And then the bonuses, if you set things up properly, will drive your people day to day. And this is, this is, this is, a, this is kind of a linchpin to the whole thing that we're talking about today. It's like to pull yourself properly out of the day to day and to get something that's predictable that you can grow and sustain and people can be you know, back you on, you need to have a system and, and this work structure I think really well illustrates what, what a powerful system can do. Benji, Barry, any final thoughts on this? Anybody else's questions? I just, I, I think if, if you're in a position right now where you're constantly feeling like you're dragging the team behind you, right? Pulling them along, telling them why they have to do this or why this number matters or why they have to, you know, just always being the motivating force. This piece, as Danny says, is the linchpin. This is exactly what's missing, is taking the organizational goals, picture it as a pie, slice it up into pieces, and then hand it off to your team and say, this is yours now. You own it. Yeah. Cool. So let's go into one more. One, one last, one last, very quick comment here, and it's just about the, the idea of time. If you find yourself on this bottom one here painting all the time, um, I don't know what a good painter makes, maybe somewhere from 16 to 25 bucks an hour. Um, that's a 16 to $25 an hour job and you've agreed on it and they're happy with that. So you can, they have their accountabilities, their deliverables are in place. This top role of, of president here looks like I did the math is about an $86 an hour job. If you're planning on generating about 180,000 in net profit, it's completely different, you know? So if you find yourself always going down to that painting role, then it's just, it's good to, to understand, um, your value of time and the impact you're going to do. So that's why you do want to put deliverables on yourself as well. Um, so that you know that what your expectations, expectations are on yourself. But again, that's where I think everyone needs a coach. Even Michael Jordan needed a coach. Even his coach needed a coach. Um, now you have that coach that's kind of holding you accountable to make sure that you are doing that, you know, 1.2 produce 40 GP and the 180 in net profit. Cool. Great. Let's get into how to, how to do this a little bit. Just one little, little point on this is using proper job descriptions. So the way we build these is we have all the job descriptions have deliverables at the top. So those key numbers that we just indicated actually make their way into the job descriptions. And then we have accountabilities that then describe what each deliverable actually is. So if you're trying to hit 1.5 at a 44% gross profit margin, here's all the deliverables that go into delivering projects on budget and on time, right? So we'll, I think we have an example for you guys we're going to send out um, for all those that are on the line, but I think it's like a nine page employment agreement that you can just use. 
So you can start to get the template drawn up properly, but this will really clarify what they actually need to do based on the numbers you need to hold them to based on the strategic plan that was built initially. This also helps with recruiting because you can start to see, well, what are the tasks that this person's gonna be in charge of? Should I actually recruit for a person that can handle this kind of stuff, right? Um, Barry, any, any just like comments on what, what this has done for your team, just putting in these types of job descriptions? I mean, everyone's seen a job description before, but the idea is to have the right content in it because the right content um, will attract the right people. So I think that's the most important part. I don't think you need to overcomplicate it. Um, I think having been very clear on the de deliverables and the accountabilities will, will naturally bring in the right people. Because the last thing you want to do is, you know, put out a job description on your, on your advertising sources, whatever it is, Craigslist, Indeed, referrals, et cetera, and have 100 people come in and 99 of them, you know, are completely, they have no idea what the job is for. You're just wasting your own time at that point. Cool. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward a bit just for time here. Uh, so the final, final thought on this whole thing is just taking time in your calendar to lead your people and build good systems versus doing kind of everything yourself. And I think that for a lot of people, you need to kind of look at it. We were to be well, Barry, you said it earlier. It's like you need to look at what your time is actually worth and realize if you're doing something that's an entry-level job or even a $25 to $30 an hour job, it's probably, especially if you're scaling up right now, it's probably not worth your time anymore. But I would really recommend for a lot of you is to take some time, write down all the things you do in a week, and then circle the things that are highest time consumption and lowest skill. And that's usually an indicator of something you need to either delegate down to your current team or the next person you might be hiring for. And what you can fill with that time is things like this. Things like goal setting and review, where you sit down with your staff and we get all of our members to do this at VTA, where you have them sit down with their guys on a Monday and do a goal setting thing where they say, hey, what's your goal for the week? How did last week go? Did you hit? Did you miss? And they become, they go from being bosses to their, their team being coaches. And they coach their people through the year and help them drive the results instead of the owner doing it every day. And Barry, like, I, I know this is a big part of your week. But it's like for you, like, why is this important to you? And then how have you found GSNR just working goal setting review with your team? It's been, yeah, it's been pretty, pretty game changing, I would say, because it's, you know, Without a GSNR, um, how do people know what the most important tasks are or what the most important goals are? And I'm not talking for the quarter because we wrote our strategic plan, assuming we're all going to do this from here on out. Um, we don't generally speak in what we're doing for the month, but specifically for that week, what are the highest impact priorities that your staff can do to help you achieve the goals over the next five days? Um, and so we, we do this with everyone now. We do this with our sales center team. We do this with our franchisees. We do this with our coach. Um, Scott, my business partner, and I do them together. Um, and it might seem like a lot of time, but keep in mind the importance of it is to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they need to do. They've bought into it because they helped write the goals out. And then we have something to follow up with them on the next Monday to go, how did this, how did this happen? And if they, if, if they didn't hit a goal, we find out why, if they did hit a goal, we find out why the point isn't to kind of point fingers. The point is to continue to learn so that we can continue to set goals that allow us to hit, hit that uh, annual goal at the end. Cool. Yeah. At the end of the day, if, if, if you have clarity on where you're going, everybody else can start to have clarity, especially if you take the time to help them. But if you don't have any clarity, you can't do any of this, right? But it's like, it's, it, everything is building to this idea that we've been talking about today where you're building this machine, right? You're, again, I'll go back to this, strategic plan, financial budget, org structure, job descriptions. It's now using those job descriptions and reinforcing them every day by helping set goals and on a weekly basis reviewing that. And now your team is aligned. And this is the missing piece that I think a lot of guys in the trades and home services are missing because they're so busy just doing what they do every day, being good at what they're naturally good at. And they need to realize like you need to transition from being a doer of all things, let's say, to kind of a builder of awesome systems and, and a leader of awesome people. And it takes work and it takes time. And it takes some intervention, I'd say, into what you're normally used to doing. But over time, and I would say, Barry, like you tell me how long this took, but like it, it becomes quite real. Like how long did it take you to get a lot of what we just talked about today in place properly? Again, it's like, it's, it's like that kind of two week to month thing where you really start to, you know, you build the system in place, you make some adjustments, you, you kind of put your brand on it and stuff like that.
but it's that like anything, it's that repetition that week after week after week, you get better and better and better at setting um, very specific and measurable goals. Um, and you start to see better results as your business grows, or if you're already there, um, there's the other component to it. You get better and better at running the GSNR. So not just writing your own goals for yourself or your partner or your coach, um, but you're actually now running your team's GSNRs. And that's a completely different skill set to learn. Um, but again, after time and time and time, you get better and better and better. So I would say it's, it's, it doesn't take too long to set up, um, but it's that repetition that really allows you to get better at, uh, at doing them and also better at, at coaching them. Um, we're going to shift gears here. We're going to transfer out a little bit, but, um, all of this stuff we've been talking about, because I think a lot of you, you're all just so you know, we, this is everyone that's on the webinar today has, has, has heard of VTA before. So we kind of did an internal, I guess I could say promotion to all of you guys so you can see a bit about what we're doing. Um, I thought I would speak a bit to where all this is coming from and a bit of the backbone of VTA, but instead of me even doing it, Barry, I just, I give you a chance to kind of speak a little bit to VTA and kind of what, what we do and, and what you've gotten out of working with us for the last three years. Yeah, I mean, it's when we, when Danny first call, called me, it was kind of like, um, you know, he shared his story with me. And that's what really resonated is that there is that there is that um, almost like a, like they understand what we're going through, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, they understand where we wanted to be our vision because they had been there already. Um, between the two of them, they had both ran, you know, multi-million dollar painting businesses. Um, Igor had built a franchise or system with, with someone else. And so, um, so we, we were really able to kind of, um, get clear on, they were able to get clear on what we wanted to do. And as, as BTA started to roll out, um, there was a lot more tangible, not, not just the, some really strong coaching involved, but there's a lot more tangible, um, pieces as well. So the things like the systems and the marketing plans and the, you know, business planning stuff, all these templates and systems that we can use so we don't have to go and create them all um so that was a huge component the last one was really about this um it's kind of like this this group the, the this dynamic culture it's, it's kind of weird like it's it's almost hard to say it. you're not going to get this from like the better business bureau or like your local home builders association or whatever whatever it is there's this unique kind of vibe around it where we have a bunch of people that are ultimately really doing the same thing, whether you're in construction or painting or junk removal or um, window cleaning, power washing, whatever it is, everyone's servicing people and we're doing it by employing great people. That's really what we're doing at the end of the day. So everyone's experiencing the same challenges, successes. Um, I've developed some lifelong friends throughout this process, um, gone on our own individual trips to go and, and, and kind of do some, some fun stuff, a little bit of business stuff. We also go to the winter and, and summer summit events every year where we get to go hang out in, you, you know, in the nature and, and get to know each other and, and do some strategic planning stuff. So overall, the, it's, it's pretty incredible just to be able to be around like-minded people. So that's kind of the intangible benefit, I would say. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, just to give you guys an idea, like Benji and me have probably talked to some of you we have a whole program. It's multi years long. There's a first step to it all where we put you through like a six week kind of over overview of how to run your business, give you all your templates, kind of give you a bit of a business in a box. It really covers in depth a lot of the stuff we touched on today. So effective business planning and financial budgeting, organizing your business properly. So building a proper org structure, understanding at a very high level, recruiting tactics and how to hire people, training and coaching your staff. So getting a training process in place, optimizing your sales process so it's duplicatable and you can actually hire someone to eventually take on sales. And then finally, just like really good discipline, goal setting and execution and planning your business. So basically if we talked about stuff today that you're like, this is kind of my wheelhouse. This is the stuff that we need right now. We're struggling to put in place. If you're at a place in business, usually our guys are somewhere between a half a million and 5 million bucks a year in revenue. If you're in roofing or renovations, it's usually more about a million to 10 million bit of a different just industry and how that works. But if you're struggling to grow and or you're growing out of control and it's getting to a point where you need systems, like this is, this is why we're here. This is what we've created. Um, you know, we've had some interesting results. Like I'll you know, show you, this is uh, 
last year's results we tracked. So we have, we have a live data on every biggest business we work with, including Barry's. We had a 43% revenue increase per member last year on average, which I think is great, but I think that also kind of organically happens with the economy we have. But I think what's really interesting, we had a 66% net profit increase per member on average last year. And it just speaks to a lot of the, the initiatives that we just talked to today in creating efficiencies and really focusing on where there are a lot of wasted time, money, and effort. And I'm sure all of you can attest to your own business when you look at it, you're like, there's a lot of shit in here that needs to change if we're actually going to grow. So we're really trying to focus on those more than anything. And I think just a lot of our guys, they got that, that, that spirit back in them. Um, you, you can only work 80 hours a week for so long before you're burnt out. You can only do stuff you don't like for so long before it becomes no fun anymore. And we really, I think we pump the fun back into business. Um, we're here with you. We're here to hang out, have fun. And we're here to get your time away from the stuff that's not working, get you more working on the company properly. So it's kind of what we do. Um, other than that, uh, basically next steps, if you are interested, is to book what's called a one-on-one -on -one business assessment, um, where we'll also give you a copy of this master business planning file to help you track your numbers and, and get to know you a bit better. Now, it is Benji's in my time, so we'll usually put about two hours to meeting with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, some of you are already scheduled for some of this, which is great. Um, if you're not scheduled and you're pretty serious about wanting to look into this, um, feel free to schedule a time. If you're like, ah, this is cool information, but I'm nowhere near starting to implement any of this stuff, that's okay. We don't want to waste your time or ours. We just, we want to sit down with the right guys. So if you're interested in doing this, Benji just put a little link in the, uh, the description here. That'll basically allow you to go in there and book yourself a time in Benji's calendar. Um, we put a lot of time and care and attention into everybody we bring in. Um, our members to us are, are kind of like, we treat them like mini franchisees. I mean, we don't own your business, but we really put a lot of love into it. And it starts with getting to know you personally really well. So we'll spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, we'll analyze the business, we'll analyze the numbers, we'll help you kind of individually think through what's coming up next in your company. And if we can help you grow, awesome, we'll be a part of your world. And if we can't, all good. Um, so if you're interested in that, take a look at the link in the description and you can, uh, you can book a time. If, um, if you're just like, this is about a year out from now, um, let us know. We're probably gonna follow up with you. Uh, Brennan, who's with me in the office here, um, he will do follow-up calls with everybody just to check in. So just to see who everybody is and uh, where they're at. So even if you're watching this is a recording, I uh, usually follow up with all of our leads and uh, we'll see. We'll see if we can help you. But um, other than that, what I would love to know is uh, 